Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning, and uh, let's open with prayer at this time, please. Father, we give thanks for this time together uh, to look into your word. We thank you for the hymns we've been singing. Thank you for uh, just the hope that is ours in our Savior and him alone. We thank you and praise you, O oh God, for um, this opportunity to look into your word. Help us, Lord, and give us guidance by your spirit that uh, we might benefit from what is said here today. <coughs> Lord, bless your word wherever it goes out today in the world. There's so many different places where the gospel is going out. We pray that souls would be saved. Thank you for each and every one who is here. And bless those who are away. Undertake for them too, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if we could turn to uh, the book of Hebrews. As you may have guessed, uh, there were some little hints there that in the hymns that were chosen. Um, we're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm going to read uh, verses 15 to 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 15 through 20. And so after he had patiently endured, that is the Lord Jesus, or excuse me, Abraham, I'm sorry, he obtained the promise, for men indeed swear by the greater an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. One of the things we're going to be talking about a little bit today is anchors. Now, some of you, has anyone here ever had any experience with an anchor, boating at all? Some have, okay? And I'm sure that some of you uh, that have been on the big ships, and I've never been on one of the big ships, but I know some of you that have on cruises or been on, uh, uh, like I'm sure Rick could tell us about the anchor that was on uh, the ships that he was on. Uh, Anchors come in many different sizes and shapes, don't they? And uh, we're going to be talking about anchors today, but one of the things that we are going to be talking about too is God and God's word to us and the credibility of God. How credible is God's word? And... Uh, and we'll be exploring that a little bit more. But obviously, the verse that we uh, the, the verse that we read about the anchor, uh, we'll be talking about that later. And I want you to think about that as we go through this, the first part of the message today. One of the things, by the way, that uh, I've, I've always found interesting is when you're out boating. If you throw out the anchor, most of the time you can't see it, right? I mean, you know whether it's holding or not, but you can't see it. And as we know that we are saved by grace, but we also are saved by faith, right? But we who are believers know our anchor is there because... Uh, the Lord Jesus is secure. And that's what I want to encourage, one of the things I'd like to encourage you with today. 
But we need anchors in our lives today, don't we? Uh, sin and the wind and the waves of the world, they can pull us away from the righteous ways that we should be following. And you know, people choose substitute anchors in their lives. They choose substitute anchors to hold them in the seas of life when things get bad. But these anchors don't hold. You know, there's nothing like having our Creator to hold us safely in the storms we face, is there? Because we are going to face storms. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, or the verses we read in verses 13 and 14, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he, that is Abraham, obtained the promise. As I said, we're going to be talking about God's word to us and what he says to us, and can we count on that? And why should we count on it? You know, it says in, uh, it says in Philippians 2, verse 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and and to do for his good pleasure. And the question is, do I believe that? God works in you and me. If we are believers, God is working in us to do both to, to will and to do for his good pleasure. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh. Why or why is God saying these things to us? We've read these verses, so what? What do they mean to us? What do they mean to you and to me? I want to read verses 17 to 19 again, very briefly. It says, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, that's you and me, he wants to show to you and me the immutability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Immutable. There's a big word. That's a big word, isn't it? Immutable means unchanging. It says, we read here, what God promised was immutable. So what does that mean? What is, what, are, what, are, what is the author here trying to say to us? What is scripture trying to tell us? It tells us that immutable is unable to be changed. It can't be changed. Not capable or susceptible to change. Isn't it good to know that we have a God who makes promises, and when he makes a promise to us, as he did to Abraham, it can never change. And of course, we've talked about Abraham before and how he was promised to have this, you know, the son and this, a great nation and, and how that he and Sarah were allowed to get very old, beyond the, beyond the age of having children. And yet God, his promise to Abraham, just like his promises to us, the promises are immutable. They cannot change, no matter what happens. Now, the, there's two, it says there's two immutable things. The first one is, it says, every word of God is true. It is impossible for him to lie. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? Do I believe that it's impossible for God to lie? And you're probably saying, well, of course I don't 
think God can lie. Sometimes I think he, I wish he'd hurry up in answering, but it's impossible for him to lie. God's word, once it's spoken, is 100% reliable. His promises in his word are 100% reliable. Now, the second immutable thing is that God confirmed his promise to Abraham by an oath. Now, we don't see this in our world today. It's my understanding in the old days, back in history and, and, and through the years, that when someone made a vow to someone else, and they made a promise, they would swear that promise by an oath. They might even take the Bible. I swear on the Bible. Have you ever heard that expression? I swear by God. Or someone will say, uh, if they're not a believer, they might say, I swear, I, I've actually heard the expression, I swear by Jupiter. They're trying to find someone or something that has more credibility to reaffirm their words. In other words, back then, if someone said, I swear on the Bible, I swear by God that I will carry through with this promise, this agreement, whatever we're dealing with here, I swear. And, you know, that has kind of, that was, that somebody's word would, meant something. Because they were actually afraid, if they didn't carry it out, that God would in some way judge them. Boy, I swore that I would do this. If I don't do it, you know, whatever it would be, there's going to be bad things. God is going to make sure there's repercussions. That has gotten lost, as you know, in the world today. People verified their promises by an oath back then. They invoked the name of God, and to break that oath would be to invoke God's wrath. God would, you know, you've heard the expression, I'll be struck by lightning, or something like that. But today's, today, oaths don't have any credibility. Some very important people, even some of our leaders, can say things, and they don't anymore mean it or intend to carry it out, as we well know. They just plain tell untruths. They're not afraid of repercussions. They're not afraid of uh, what God thinks. They just don't tell the truth. Or maybe in many cases, people think, you know, I will, I will follow through on this. I will do this. I agree to do this or that or the other. Pay money. Do a job. Whatever it would be. All of you can tell me stories of, you know, I had this contractor come over. He agreed to do this. And I paid him so much money down and then he never showed up. Have you heard that story? Why am I saying all this? Well, people lie or tell untruths or don't carry out their oaths because there's no conscience or fear of retribution. They just think, well, I'll, I'll get away with it. I got away with it before and I'll get away with it again. Today, in many cases, there is no fear of bringing dishonor to God if you don't carry out your word. But, and this is our anchor, when God makes an oath, when he says he's going to do something, he is never tempted to not carry out his word. And we can stand on that. We can rest in that. When he makes an oath for our sakes, we can be sure the promise is secure. And as God has done, there is no 
breaking it as far as God goes. He will never break his word to us. He made a promise to Abraham, and even though it took a long time, it was as good, when he made that promise, it was as good as fulfilled. We can trust him that he will carry out his promises. And isn't that the basic truth of the anchor? The anchor holds. It holds, and we were singing, it grips the solid rock, and the rock is the Lord Jesus. The anchor was formed in the mind of God and came to fulfillment at the time of creation. Here's what Galatians 4, 4, and 5 says. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of son, as sons. Do we believe that promise? Absolutely. God will carry out his promise to us. Now let's look at three purposes. I just want to look brief, briefly at three purposes of an anchor. First of all, and there could be many more. I'm, I'm sure you can name more. And if you can, you can tell me those when we're finished here today. But I just picked out three. An anchor holds during the storm. To hold the ship and to allow it to roll with the flow in a storm, it keeps the ship from capsizing. Because the ship will face the wind, from my understanding, and it will, not, it will keep it from flipping over, capsizing. The howling winds and the waves and the boat, I, from my understanding, I've never seen this or heard this, but they say that in some of these ships, they creak and groan in these, in these uh, storms. You know, when the anchor's pulling against the frame of that vessel. And yet the anchor holds. John 16, says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You know, the anchor, if you're in a ship like that, it calms the fear of destruction. If you didn't have that anchor, you very well could perish. Jesus Christ is, an, is the rock which the anchor grips, and he, this anchor that we have is of the greatest quality. The worse the storm, his hold is deeper and firmer. Storms should not drive our souls away from the Lord, but draw us deeper into the rock of ages. Isn't that wonderful to know that our anchor holds in the storms of life? Number two, and I didn't think about this, but I was doing a little research. The anchor holds the ship even in calm waters. When things are going well, are we still anchored? Are we still anchored? He holds us firm when we're in times of blessing. Maybe we're in a, a, a protected bay in our life, you know? We've come to that point in our life where we're, things are good. Things are, things are not, there's no storm going on. But sometimes those are the times, aren't they, when we can wander away. We can, you know, forget that we are anchored in the Lord. Our, our Lord keeps us in himself at these times. And then thirdly, the anchor is there to, to give us rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Can we rest in our anchor? Remember Job 34, 29 says, When he gives quietness, who then can make trouble? When he hides his face, 
Who then can see him, whether it is against a nation or a man alone? Psalms 36, 7 and 8 says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. There's nothing like taking the struggles of life and placing them on the altar of the Lord. When I've done all I can do, and I can do mo no more, all we have to do is give it to the Lord and he'll take it from there. You know, there was a little story that I found, and I'll just read it to you. It says, when Lloyd Douglas, author of The Robe and other novels, was a university student, he lived in a boarding house. Downstairs on the first floor was an elderly, retired music teacher who was handicapped and unable to leave the apartment. Douglas said that every morning they had a ritual that they would go through together. He would come down the steps, open the old man's door and ask, what's the good news? The old man would pick up his tuning fork, tap it on the side of his wheelchair and say, that's middle C. It was middle C yesterday, it will be middle C tomorrow. It will be middle C a thousand years from now. The tenor that lives upstairs sings flat. The piano across the hall is out of tune. This music teacher you sees these things. But my friend, that is middle C. The old man had discovered the one thing upon which he could depend, the one constant reality in his life, one still point in a troubled world. For Christians, the one still point in a troubled world, the absolute of which there is no shadow of turning, is Jesus Christ. See, we have our middle C, don't we? He's always in tune. We can always depend on him. He is our solid rock. Now, just in summary, we're anchored to Christ. Are we anchored to Christ or are we tethered to the world? Are we anchored in Christ or tethered to the world? How can we be anchored to Christ? By reading his word. Success in a hostile world Without God's word, we're like, if you can picture it in the storm, and I don't know if any of you have ever been out on a rubber raft, I have. If you're out in a storm in your little rubber raft and that thing's bouncing around in the waves, you know what I mean? And you're certainly not anchored, right? You're just blown everywhere. We're just like little rubber rafts without the word of God. We're just bouncing around. Je uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? We need to make sure we know what we're following and who we're anchored to. James 1, 14 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. We're all tempted, aren't we? We all face temptation. There's always that, that draw, I, I guess I would say, to be disobedient or to follow, uh, to get away from our anchor. There's delusion, there's deception, and there's discouragement. There are all three. All of those are tools Satan uses to diminish, his, diminish our effectiveness as a believer. Deception, delusion, and discouragement. How do we get deluded? Well, by neglecting God's word, right? By not staying 
in him, remaining in him. We can be deceived. You can go on YouTube today and get thousands of interpretations of Scripture. Thousands. How do we know? How, how do we know that we're, you know, we are anchored in Christ or that what we're hearing is really the truth? Discouragement. That's a great way to lose our effectiveness as a believer, isn't it? We get to feeling sorry for ourselves. Times are difficult, troubled. And Satan can use that to, effect, to have an effect on our testimony and our lives. We need to rely on God's strength and not our own. I love that when we were reading there in verse... Uh, 19, it says, We have an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. And where does that anchor go? It says it enters the presence behind the veil. Do you ever stop and think about that? We are anchored behind the veil. If we know the history of the veil in the temple, who went in there? Only the high priest, right? And only under certain circumstances, there were many, you just didn't go there. But we have an anchor behind the veil. We have access into the very presence of God. Not just once a year or whatever, but all the time. Sure and steadfast. I love that. We have access into God's presence, and it's sure and steadfast and can never be taken away. Now, that's the kind of anchor I want. What a blessing. It says in verse 20 there, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever to the order of Melchizedek. And that's another message in itself. But that whole idea of the Lord Jesus being our high priest, he's our anchor. He's there behind the veil, as it were, in heaven for us. He has access to the very creator, God in heaven. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, nor angels or demons. Neither are fears for today nor worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, it isn't just the anchor, is it? You have to have a good cable or a chain to hold the anchor, right? And that's what all this says to us. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. We have an anchor in Christ, and he is the immutable one. Never changes. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I think we need this in this world today. When we look around, and I know Deb and I go in different places, we'll look and we'll see this and that and the other thing that's happening and you know, just what people are doing and how they act and this and that. And not that we're perfect by any means, but you just see people who are not near the Lord. They have no knowledge of God, it would appear. I don't know what they're anchored to, but it isn't the Lord. And we can be so thankful that we have one who is, uh, who never changes. He's immutable. Romans 15, 13 says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In other words, as we trust our anchor, right? 
that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit helps us. He helps us to, to uh, be able to grasp the immutability of God, the unchangeableness of God. The Holy Spirit is a valuable resource. If you are having problems in your life and troubles with faith, then ask the Holy Spirit to help you to see what a powerful anchor we have. We need to focus on God and not our selfish desires. Someone has said, the core of being a Christian is not about our actions, but about our relationship with Christ, who is our anchor. 2 Thessalonians 3.5 says, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. I trust that everyone here today has put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus and that you are anchored in the one who never changes, never breaks his word. Like I said, sometimes you think, wow, Lord, this promise you made, uh, when's this going to happen? But you know what? Think of Abraham. When that promise was made, it was as good as fulfilled. God's promises to us are as good as fulfilled. And I, I know that uh, this is, I have a song here that we don't have in our book anymore, but I'd just like to read this. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? It, will safe, it is safely moored Will the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables passed from his heart to mine can defy that blast through strength divine. When our eyes behold through the gathering night the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore when the storms all pass forevermore, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Walt, if you'd like to come up and lead us and ladies with that other song and then I'll close in prayer. Number 511 uh, is the song we picked out. And uh, if you don't mind, could we stand again for this, please? Uh, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 511, the solid rock. <clears throat>
just close with prayer. You can, you can be seated. Lord, we thank you again for your precious word. We thank you, O oh God, that in a world of deception and wickedness and unsurety and fear, we thank you, O oh God, that we have uh, a God who is true to his word and always has been and always will be for all eternity. Lord, help us to remain in our Savior, to remain in him, and to remain in your word, Lord, because it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And it helps us, Lord, to see in these dark times we've been singing about. Thank you, Father, for the hope that is ours. May we be joyful and rejoicing in our salvation today and every day. And may we be those who are lights on a hill that people see, and they see the Lord Jesus is our strength. Bless us as we uh, um, end this service, and Lord, bless the service to follow. We give thanks for each and every one here today, and bless our fellowship together. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.